We are now into our new book called Interactions of Matter, and I'm going to label the first chapter of that book, Chapter 6, in our unit for the year. This unit's going to uh, focus on chemical bonding, and we're going to discover that there's different types of chemical bonding, and it's going to lead us to interpreting how in chemical reactions happen, how to write chemical reactions, and read chemical formulas. So let's get right into it. Have you ever stopped to consider that using only the 26 letters of the alphabet, you can make all the words you use every day? And although the numbers of letters is limited, 26, combining those letters in different ways allows you to make huge number of words. In the same way that the words can be formed by combining letters, substances can be formed by combining atoms as well. Let's get into the definition of chemical bonding. Chemical bonding is going to be the joining of atoms to form a new substance. Elements are going to use their outermost electrons, which we know as valence, to help them bond. The electrons can either be shared or transferred between elements. So we'll, I'll show you a bunch of diagrams on um, how to know when they're going to be shared and when they're going to be transferred. All right, if we look at this picture from the book, it shows us that the first energy level is closest to the nucleus and it can hold a total of a, two electrons. We know from electron configuration, 1s2 would be a full, um, complete orbital ring for the first valence. Electrons will begin to fill their second energy level only after the first one is totally full. So if you can recall the game that we had on our desks with marbles, we had to fill the first level before we could begin filling the second level. The second level can only hold up to eight electrons. So you see in this diagram, they have the electrons paired in twos. Two, four, six, eight would fill the second level. In the third level, um, in this model of chlorine, this atom has seven electrons in its valence. So if you add up all the electrons in all three rings, you get a total of 17 electrons. This outer level of atom, um, in the atom, for this chlorine atom, this outer level is not full. And you could see this one lone electron does not have a pair. So that's how we're going to symbolize it in our drawings. We're gonna show that all the electrons have a pair except for the one lone electron in that outer valence. And if we count up the electrons to 17, we realize that chlorine is number 17 on the periodic table, and we can identify that we're talking about chlorine. This is before bonding. We can only do that. Let's recall how many electrons are in each group. Go ahead and pause the video and write, draw a really quick um, outline of the periodic table divided into the different columns, not too concerned about the transition metals, group one, group two, group 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and group 18. Go ahead and make a quick little diagram of the periodic table, pause the video, and I want you to write above it how many valence electrons are in each group. Okay, you should have wrote that the first column, group one, alkali metals, is going to have one valence. Group two has two valence. Group 13 has three. Group 14 has four. Group 15 has five. Group 16 has six. Group 17 has seven. And group 18 has eight valence. The only exception with group 18 is that helium is going to have only two valence because it only has two electrons total. So this is pretty fresh coming out of chapter five. Um, but we're going to have to recall it for this new chapter. You have to know, using a periodic table when you answer questions, you have to know, for instance, sodium has one valence, aluminum has three, fluorine has seven. You're going to need to recall this quickly when you do um, the problems in this new chapter. Remember, atoms with one, two, or three valence are going to give away their electrons. We talked about it in chapter five. These atoms have very low valence, one, two, or three. Eight is the magic number, so they're not even halfway there. Therefore, they're going to get rid of their electrons. They're going to give them away. These are going to be mostly metals, with the exception of boron, which is a metalloid. But you can see that these atoms want to give away their valence because they want to look like a noble gas. If they get rid of their outer valence of one, two, or three, 
then they're going to lose that outer valence that wasn't full and the one right below it will be full and it will, it will um, be like a noble gas. So those are the elements that have low valence. They're going to be metals, except for boron, and they're going to give away their electron. Atoms with 5, 6, or 7 valence are very close to being happy. They're very close to the magic number 8. Um, group uh, 15 has 5 valence, so it only needs 3 more electrons to be happy. Group 16 has 6 valence, 2 more to be happy. And group 17, the halogens, want 1 more electron to be happy. If they can gain these electrons or steal them from atoms that want to give them away, then they'll resemble a noble gas which noble gases have full valence. So they'll kind of resemble a noble gas. So these are all going to be nonmetals. There are some exceptions. There are some metalloids in there. But primarily nonmetals, they want to steal valence electrons from atoms that want to give them away. So you notice the metals want to give them away, generally, and the nonmetals in general want to steal. Have you ever accidentally tasted seawater? If so, you probably didn't enjoy it very much. What makes seawater taste different from water in your home? Seawater tastes different because salts dissolved in it. One of the salts in seawater is the same as the salt that you eat, NaCl. The chemical bonds in salt are called ionic bonds. So we're going to discuss kind of what exactly ionic bonds are and what makes them unique from other bonds. All right, so let's discuss characteristics of ionic bonds. The first characteristic is that ionic bonds form when electrons are going to be transferred from one atom to another. In this diagram right here, we have sodium giving an electron to chlorine. Sodium wants to get rid of it because it only has one electron, so it'll be happy if it gets rid of it. Chlorine wants to accept that electron so it can have a full valence and be happy as well. Ionic bonds are going to be made from a metal and a nonmetal. When that metal gives away an electron, it's going to become a positive ion. And we'll discuss a little bit more of that on the next slide. And when the nonmetal accepts that electron, it's going to be a negative ion. Ionic bonds. When we, when we take those compounds that have ionic bonds in them and we dissolve it in water, they're going to conduct electricity. And the reason why they conduct electricity is because there's a metal in that bond. There's always going to be a metal in an ionic bond giving the electron to a nonmetal. And because that metal is there, ionic bonds are going to conduct electricity because we know that metals conduct electricity and thermal energy. Ionic bonds tend to be solids at room temp, and they form a crystal lattice structure, which is a 3D regular repeating structure. You, you see that I have one on my desk. Check it out. That's going to be a salt crystal. The little green um, spheres in that crystal lattice structure are going to be the Na, and the uh, larger, sorry, the gray ones are going to be Na, and the larger green ones are going to be Cl. And we'll look at that and, and reference it over and over. But that crystal lattice structure is so strong that it keeps, um, it keeps solids at room temp. But it also makes ionic bonds have really high melting points and boiling points than molecules. Molecules is going to reference a different type of bond. Ionic bonds have that crystal lattice structure, which is very tight, very rigid. It's going to make ionic bonds melt with a very much higher melting point, which means if we were going to do a heating test and have um, the other type of bond, which is called covalent bonds, versus an ionic bond, the covalent bond will melt faster. Um, because the ionic bonds have a really high melting point because of that crystal lattice structure. You have to break all those bonds apart in order to get them to melt. And they're very tight together, 3D pattern. Okay, let's look at more characteristics of ionic bonds. Just kind of repeating a little bit, ionic bonds are going to be formed as a result of an electrostatic attraction between ions. And what I mean by electrostatic attraction is that the metal ions are going to give away an electron. They're giving away a negative electron. Therefore, they're going to feel more positively charged. 
that's an electrostatic attraction to the nonmetal ions which are going to receive that electron and feel more negative in charge. So it's an electrostatic attraction between metal ions that are positive combined with nonmetal ions that are negative. Let's go see this dog and bone analogy and you can see um, these two dogs fight over their bones and the bones are going to represent the electrons. Now, this is a great website. If you just Google um, dog and bone analogy, you'll get this great um, just you know different visual of what's happening in ionic bond. So let's zoom into this um, animation of ionic bonding. You get the small dog that's carrying his bone at the beginning and he runs into the larger dog that's carrying the bone. Uh, you have one big greedy dog stealing the other dog's bone. If the bone represents an electron that's up for grabs then when the, bone, the big dog gains the electron, he becomes negatively charged. And the little dog who loses an electron becomes positively charged. The two ions, that's where the name ionic bonding comes from, the two now ions are very attractive because they have opposite charges. So they're going to be attracted towards each other. All right, if we drop this sodium into the chlorine gas, um, sodium is generally a silver colored metal while chlorine is going to be a greenish colored toxic gas and if we drop that sodium in it instantly reacts violently to the chlorine and if you take a look at what exactly is happening in this reaction you can see that the sodium is giving its electron to chlorine sodium is going to lose an electron and become a positive ion positive one ion because it just lost one electron while the chlorine becomes a negative one ion because it just gained one electron. The resulting compound is held together by these electrical charges, a positive and negative charge. And the result is a new compound called sodium chloride. Sodium chloride is the salt that's left on the bottom of the beaker. Electron, that looks cool. Hey, I want to get rid of this electron. Oh, thank you. All right, I guess we're yes. bonded. You're my partner now. Yes, perfect. All right, thanks, thanks for watching. <laughs> hey, don't turn off the video yet. Read the slide. Prepare for class tomorrow.